Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Practice Standards webinar on resource mobilization. We're going to give people just a minute or two to join, and then we'll get started. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, we would love to have you, um, the attendees, tell us who you are and where you're from. If you can put your name and where your um, your organization, where you're joining us from, in the chat. Um, please make sure that you address it to attendees and panelists, not just panelists. Otherwise, we're the only ones who see it. So, um, just to uh, have a sense of community and know where everyone's coming from. Again, if you could put your your name and uh, where you're joining us from in the uh, in the chat addressed to panelists and attendees. And we'll get started in just a few minutes. Nice to see everybody. So far, we've got Mauritania and the Caribbean and Florida and Colombia. Nice to see everyone. All right, we'll give one just one more minute and then we'll kick off. Great. I want to welcome everybody to the fifth webinar on the practice standards for conservation trust funds, the updates to the 2020 edition of the practice standards. Uh, this is the fifth in our webinar series, which will be going on throughout 2021. And today's topic is resource mobilization. I'm Katie Mathias with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Conservation Finance Alliance Secretariat, and happy to welcome you all today. We have a great topic on resource mobilization. So I just want to give a quick overview of um, a few quick logistics before we get started. Uh, if you're just joining us, we'd love to see who you are and where you're from. If you can uh, add your name and your where you're joining us from in the chat um, in the chat box, make sure you address it to both panelists and attendees. And uh, we have a Q&A function. So if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A throughout the webinar, and we will have a, a conversation after the panelists have presented. So um, please just add them there and, um, and we'll be sure to get to them. So with that, I'm going to kick off. Our first um, speaker is Amilcar Guzman, who is a partner with Wolf's Company and one of the co-authors of the 2020 edition of the Practice Standards. So Amilcar will be giving an overview of what's new with the Practice Standards, uh, specifically in the resource mobilization core area. So Amirka, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Katie. And thanks for the, well, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to the webinar. Um, it's very exciting to, to be presenting here on, on this topic that I'm sure is very important for many of the attendees, uh, probably many conservation trust funds or other people working on uh, conservation finance in general. So um, I'm a partner uh, at Wolf's company um, Wells Company is a research uh, consultancy company, so we, we specialize in research on environmental economics, especially to support nature conservation and sustainable development. And as part of our work on, well, conservation finance, protected area finance, and, and other similar topics, uh, we were part of the, we led the, the, the update of the practice standards for conservation trust funds. This is something that we did in collaboration with Align Ambitions, Paquita Bath, and we were commissioned by the Conservation Finance Alliance to do it and together with a task force or more than, of more than 25, 20 to 25 organizations, uh, including conservation trust funds, the networks of conservation trust funds, et cetera. 
So um, today I will be giving a, an overview. I, I will be giving the content overview on the practice standards to introduce the, the more theoretical aspects and, and some of the structural aspects of the practice standards before we move on to the more concrete cases of uh, BioFund and the MedFund that Roman and Shan will be presenting. So if you are um, in this webinar, I, I, I believe that you're probably familiar with the practice standards for, for conservation trust funds. You might have used, if you are a, a CTF uh, conservation trust fund representative or a donor or other organization working with conservation trust funds, you might have used the practice standards in their 2014 version. So um, what we're presenting today is the 2020 practice standards, which is an update of that uh, version. So in this uh, 2020 version, we have seven core areas. And if, if you have used them, you probably know that the, the core areas are um, the main topics that are covered in the different practice standards and they provide key content for establishment, operation and institutional development for CTFs. And each of these areas contain a number of, contains a number of, of um, standards. And today I will focus on research mobilization, well, as you all know. In research mobilization, uh, in this core area in particular, there are nine standards. Um, in the 2014 version, there were seven standards, but in, in this update, there were two new additions. One uh, that came from the previous operations uh, uh, core area, and one coming from uh, reporting, monitoring, and evaluation. So that's uh, one of the first updates in this new version. Now, um, this set of standards in this area refers specifically to fundraising to managing relationships with, um, with different stakeholders, with donors or with partners for resource mobilization. Um, and everything, all of this is to um, ensure overall financial sustainability for conservation, but not only for nature conservation, uh, but also for um, sustainable development goals, climate action, and other areas that conservation trust funds have started to um, address over the past years. So this is also something that's reflected in the standards. Here you can see um, an overview of the first five standards on resource mobilization. This of course is not for you to, to read in detail, it's very long and detailed, um, but it's what I want to stress is that one of the additions in the standards in general is that we, um, is this Annex one, which prioritizes the standards at different stages of evolution. So, um, and, and as we did it for other standards, we identified some specific practice standards on resource mobilization that might be more important or more uh, feasible or applicable to specific stages of evolution of conservation trust funds. These five stages that we identified were identified in, in, in consultation, in communication with different conservation trust funds and reflect some of the, the classifications that conservation trust funds use um, to refer to, to, to the stage they are in. So as you can see here, there are some standards uh, that are more applicable in perhaps the, 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 the startup phase and other ones that might become more relevant or perhaps a priority when CTFs um, make progress in terms of uh, their institutional maturity. So this was for the first five and then we have it for, for the rest of the, the practice standards on resource mobilization. Now, in addition to this, um, I, I will present what's new in terms of um, content in this particular area on resource mobilization. So um, in addition to, to, to having this um, classification of, of different standards by, or, or the prioritization of different standards by a stage of evolution of a of, um, conservation trust fund, um, we also included some updates in terms of underlying evidence and definitions and in terms of lessons learned and trends. And I would say that these are the two most important um, updates in this area, um, because the, the, in terms of wording and in terms of the formulation of the standards, the updates were not uh, incredibly substantial uh, with respect to the previous version. And most of the wording was respected, but we updated um, some of the, the evidence that um, explains and describes the rationale behind the standards. And I will refer to that in more detail in the next slides. 
Now, um, another important aspect is that there is explicit link to um, cross-cutting themes. So in this version of the practice standards, there are also four cross-cutting themes, and two of which are of those are presented here because those are the relevant ones for resource mobilization. These themes are some uh, key areas for CTF's uh, operations that um, could be could qualify for um, to to become a core area, but because they are uh, relevant for different um, for different uh, aspects of, of CTF operations, they um, we we put them we included them as cross cutting themes. So they they go across they they cover a range of different core areas. So for example, communications might be relevant for resource mobilization, but also for some other um, areas of work. Now, as I just mentioned, um, I would say that one of the main updates and probably one of the most substantial updates was uh, in terms of evidence um, that we incorporated into the uh, detailed descriptions of these practice standards, right? And this was uh, done um, thanks to the, um, well, to the, the, the study that we conducted in parallel to the, to the update of, of the practice standards, which was Cons Conservation Trust Funds 2020. You can also download it from, well, the websites of the networks of Conservation Trust Funds from uh, the Conservation Finance Alliance website as well. And this is the 10-year review study. And um, as part of that, we conducted a survey among 50 Conservation Trust Funds. That was the 2020 Global CTF survey. And we obtained some information that was useful to guide the updates of the standards. Um, some of this information, like the one I'm presenting here, uh, refer to um, the progress that conservation trust funds have made in terms of uh, some key aspects for some of the core areas of the in the practice standards. And in this case, um, I, I have selected one example uh, for resource mobilization standard one. Which, is, uh, which refers to um, the importance of uh, diversifying, multiplying, and increasing the sources of fund financing as something um, extremely important for resource mobilization. So um, the study provided some information that we can see here, uh, for example, in the, in the charts that uh, suggest that conservation trust funds have been making some uh, efforts and, and have been successful in the diversification of their uh, funding sources, um, if, if we see, uh, if we look at the evolution from the startup stages to more operational and institutional uh, stages in which uh, conservation trust funds gain institutional maturity. So we can see that conservation trust funds have diversified in terms of uh, funding sources, um, which reflects, which is of course reflected in the, in the practice standards as well as something crucial, not only to mobilize, to, to generate an um, increasing amounts of funding, but also to gain, for example, political legitimacy or to minimize risks. So diversification is a key issue that's addressed in the standards with some updated information. Um, another aspect that um, relates to the previous uh, slide is how conservation trust funds have, have um, try to implement, have explored different financing mechanisms. So not only sources of, of funds, but financing mechanisms um, in order to generate additional funds. We can see that um, the main mechanisms still remain. Um, in, this, in this chart, we have what conservation trust funds did over the last 10 years, right? So um, grants and other transfers, so donations to endowment funds, sinking funds, have remained as the main mechanisms, but we can see on the top part, part of the chart that uh, conservation trust funds have also explored a number of other mechanisms. Now, all these mechanisms that have surfaced um, do not necessarily live um, up to the expectations of all conservation trust funds yet. So this is what we call in the practice standards, the emerging mechanisms. And these are uh, the ones that we have at, uh, on, on, the, on the top part of the, of the chart. Uh, and are indicated with um, dark blue bars as the mechanisms that conservation trust funds want to implement over the next 10 years based on the results of this study. So this type of these types of mechanisms are also made uh, visible in the, in the practice standards, are included in the definitions, in the glossary, um, to reflect what's uh, the, the current state of uh, progress among CTFs, right? Now, the previous chart was very detailed. Um, 
I, I guess that it's hard for, for all of you uh, and attending this webinar to retain what was there. Uh, but this is um, a, a summary of some of the main mechanisms that we incorporated or updated um, in terms of their definitions or included some more details in the new version of the practice standards with respect to the previous version, right? So on, on the top part, so the, um, these um, mechanisms that we have here are essentially uh, financial instruments or fin financial mechanisms that conservation trust funds um, are using or would like to use over the, the next years. And at the bottom, we have some um, uh, strategies that are perhaps cross-cutting strategies that, for example, partnerships with the private sector that can be relevant for, for the implementation or for the, the optimal use of some of the other mechanisms. Now, uh, well, here we have some, some results as well from the study. So then the, the percentage of CTFs that expects to implement some of these mechanisms. And well, and this type of information has been integrated into some standards, uh, into some other standards. So um, these are reflected in standard one um, as a list of main mechanisms and emerging mechanisms, but also um, there are some more this, some additional descriptions on the roles that conservation trust funds can play in the implementation of these mechanisms. Uh, for example, as financial intermediaries, as partners, um, not only as the beneficiaries of these funds or the, the main implementing party in, in a financing mechanism, but sometimes just as facilitators or, or catalyzers of, of implementation. So that's something that's reflected, for example, in resource mobilization standard five, and as another example, uh, we have some of, um, some of this information in resource mobilization standard six, which refers to high level support. And in this, um, regarding this uh, specific topic, um, there is also mention of, um, there, there is also some additional information in the, in the updated version of the practice standards about some other trends uh, that are very that have been fundamental in terms of resource mobilization, which are um, some strategies such as or some approaches such as the project finance for permanent for permanence, which have been very important to uh, for mobilizing um, large scale uh, funds uh, to from different sources uh, to, to specific uh, countries and and also by using conservation trust funds as, as intermediaries. The other important uh, trend that is in integrated into the new version of the practice standards is accreditation. Um, we, 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 um, well, we identified at least eight or, or nine uh, conservation trust funds that have uh, been successful in becoming uh, accredited entities with um, Green Climate Fund, for example, and, and many conservation trust funds are also look, um, seeking um, accreditation with other multilateral or bilateral entities. So this is something that's described in standard six in relation to high level support and the importance of uh, high level support uh, in order to implement this type of approaches. So um, these of course are some examples of some of the trends and, and new information that we included, but um, there is some information that perhaps was not, um, did not go through so many changes with respect to the 2014 standards, but I, I still want to highlight it here. I will not go into, into further details in the interest of time and because uh, Roman and Eshan will have some concrete examples of, for example, uh, resource mobilization strategies and action plans, uh, the importance and the rationale behind the gift acceptance policies and uh, aspects um, such as communications, which are also fundamental for uh, resource mobilization. So all these aspects are also contained in the practice standards and although uh, there were not too many updates. I, I really invite you to to check them if you if you are part of a conservation trust fund and and would like to learn more about how to use this to to mobilize uh, additional resources. So um, I hope this provides a clear overview um, for the next presentations and 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 sets the scene in terms of the standards. And I will pass it on then to Katie to introduce the the other two panelists. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Amelkar. That was great. I want to um, point people to the chat where we have link, put the link to the practice standards if you need it, as well as the link to the 10-year review that Amelkar referenced. And um, 
because I sometimes get this, this question, I will highlight that we are working on the translation of the practice standards into both French and Spanish and hope to have that published uh, fairly soon. So uh, please know that those are coming. Um, I next want to introduce Sean Nazarelli from Biofund Mozambique. Sean is the Director of Innovative Financing for Biofund. And he is going to present the work that Biofund has been doing around innovative financing mechanisms. This in particular highlights, um, as Emilcar mentioned, the importance of diversification and not over relying on any one source or mechanism for funding, but looking at a diverse portfolio of financing tools. So, Sean, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katie. Uh, I hope everyone can, can see the screen now. And it's nice from Amilcar to set the scene like that and, and put the list of, of trends of, of financing up because really what we're trying to do here is uh, mostly all of those things on that list. Um, but I'll talk about that in a moment. So um, Biofund, I just wanted, was asked here to talk about our innovative financing ideas and activities. So we sort of see ourselves actually in many ways as an incubator for projects uh, and new mechanisms for financing here in Mozambique. It's part of our, our mission. Um, just very quickly, where Mozambique is, we're in the bottom southeast corner of, of Africa. We, what are we? We're a private independent foundation uh, and we've been around for about 10 years now. We have a number of members. We have, uh, we have an endowment fund based in the US that's just over 40 million at the moment. Uh, we have three pillars in which we operate, consolidating ourselves as an institution, then obviously our core business of financing conservation, and then working to create a better enabling environment. Within all of this, innovative financing sits firmly into the consolidation to make sure we have the necessary revenues and resources to carry out our, our main mission. Um, just a very brief overview conservation finance in Mozambique, about 26% of the national territory is protected in some form or another, but there's a huge gap of financing here as many other countries. Uh, roughly 80% of the funds for conservation in the public, publicly managed areas all comes from external uh, donors. Uh, so we need a, a great deal of support to promote long-term sustainable financing. And that's part of our role and why we were created in the first place to help establish, to help fill this gap of funds. So why do we have innovative financing initiatives? Obviously, uh, what we're looking for is trying to generate new long-term financing and diverse, diverse sources of revenue for conservation in Mozambique, exactly as Emil Kerr uh, brought up in the standard. It's important to have a variety of different sources. Uh, this may be additional resources for biofunds programs and endowment. Or it might be simply additional resources for conservation in Mozambique, and they may not touch Biofund's books at all, but that's not important as long as they become important sources for new conservation activities. So we explore these variety of sustainable financing things and we assess their, via, their feasibility in the country to, to work. So we as an institution, we think we have an added value of being a national permanent institution, so we're long-term focused. We have a detailed and long-term knowledge of the conservation sector. We have robust internal financial procedures and management capacity. We have some initial funding to explore new types of financing as well. We've managed to gen generate uh, specific grants for that. And because we're a financial mechanism rather than an implementing agency, we can actually have a step back from day-to-day -day on the ground implementation and work on uh, having the time, resources, resources. So how, what's happened? And we sort of fear ourselves, we, as I mentioned, incubator. So we have an incubator part, creating a finance solution. That then moves into strategy where we access its, its feasibility and mobilize resources for pilots and, and try to define what exactly our role in this strategy will be. Then we look to try to pilot it in some places, looking for success, if it's successful, how replicable is it? How are we going to monitor it? And how are we really going to make sure we're achieving results from this strategy? And then once a, strat once a mechanism has proven itself, then we start looking for scalability. 
moving this up to be a national level, coordinating with other partners to get involved to try to get impact and scale. I'll give a few examples of different mechanisms. I'll go through them reasonably quickly, uh, and then we can talk about them in the discussion. Uh, Co-management for protected areas is one that's now at the scalable, low, the national scale. Uh, what is that? That's a, a way of cooperative sharing between governments and partners for management of protected areas. There's a huge amount of potential for this, large NGOs and global funds. Mozambique's a very flexible country, has to develop this as, as part of its uh, um, approach to PA management. Uh, it's become official government policy. And we even have a business development unit in our protected area agency that's working on this. So our role here is concept promotion. We're doing lobby and advocacy to promote partnership and well as bringing in new, new partners and actually providing some funds to those partners when they come in for new partnerships. Beyond part of this, we've also got what we call a cartel view. This is a, a, again, a mechanism we've now got to scale. What's this? This is a Mozambique's only biodegradable debit card. It's a partnership between the largest commercial bank in Mozambique and foundation where a small percentage of revenue comes to biodiversity conservation. We're currently getting about $50,000 a year from this, from some 18,000 clients across the country. And again, as I mentioned, we're now scaling up. We'd like to double that number of clients in the next two years. Uh, we channel then funds to, to support specific conservation projects. And we see it as, as a very useful long-term financing mechanism as it's based and, and highly sustainable because it's based on our domestic market and we, as I mentioned, with one of the largest banks here. Another mechanism we've been working on, this is actually something gone from zero to scale in, in just a few months was the emergency bio fund. It was set up to respond to COVID. This was a particular one that was looked at to try to support the jobs of rangers and essential personnel to support and maintain patrolling during the COVID emergency when tourism income went to zero and many of these people are at risk of losing their jobs. Uh, it's now providing support to a huge number of protected areas across the country. Um, we're looking at more than 12, 13 million hectares of biodiversity is being protected under this program. Uh, what our role was, was to really operationalize a fast financial mechanism. We took money out of our own endowment to kickstart it. And then we took other people's money as well to make it function. And we're still gaining more donors for it. And we'll be able to continue the program right through the end of, of 2021. Uh, other mechanisms that are still in the pipeline, biodiversity offsets. This, uh, as Emilcar mentioned, is something that's growing in, pub in, in, in popularity. Uh, essentially, it's a mechanism to, a full comp to allow full compensation for impacts on biodiversity of large development projects, mines, uh, oil and gas, and so on. An interesting thing when we talk about potential on a global level, biodiversity offsets are currently the single largest source of funding of biodiversity after government budgets. They in fact provide more money to conservation than all bilateral and multilateral agencies altogether. So there's a huge amount of money in this. Most of it, of course, is being spent in the United States, Australia, and so on. But we are trying to kickstart this into a low income country such as Mozambique. We are working on legislation and helping the government on that providing technical guidelines and working on some pilot projects that will be starting up or are already starting up this year. As I mentioned, our role in this concept promotion, technical assistance on legislation metrics. We've hired some people to have a specialized unit on motive, on bringing into being a biodiversity offsets mechanism in Mozambique. In the future, perhaps we'll be a channeling intermediary for the offsets themselves, or maybe we'll just provide technical support to the different actors on how they should design them and how they can cite them in the country. Uh, Red Plus, another mechanism that's working well in Mozambique. There are already, obviously, people most all know about carbon offsets. You know what they are. There are lots of global funds available and, and larger private sector support all the time. Mozambique's been involved in Red Readiness for a long time. They even have an emission program reduction agreement signed with the World Bank for up to 10 million tons uh, of carbon reduction. We have a good unit already in Mozambique that deals with it. It's out of a different agency than us. So we only have some added value in a few key circumstances when we might be involved in channeling those funds. Otherwise we're supporting and matchmaking and bringing people together. 
Uh, we're looking now, now looking at even more speculative things. We're looking at ecosystem services for water. We're going to do some feasibility studies this year. This we're looking at, uh, obviously, you know what ecosystem services are. Uh, there is interest from global funds and, and donors, yes. A small amount of interest and much, un unfortunately, not nearly a sustainable interest from the private sector so far. Uh, so while there are some strategies in Mozambique for this, what we're going to do now is be involved in some feasibility analyses and some technical assistance once again and fund some pilots and see if it can work out for, uh, for our country. And then perhaps we'll become a channeling mechanism in the future for it. Then we're looking at all sorts of other things here again, uh, blue carbon impact investment, game farming, and how to use biodiversity and, and wildlife for, for the gain for both people and conservation. I won't talk about all of these. I just maybe want to stick out a few things on impact investment, just because we have uh, seen that the value of the impact investment market is many, many hundreds of billions of dollars. And we see that trust funds have a capacity and perhaps a good role in bringing those investors in with uh, and matching them up with good projects in country. So uh, while there's not much impact investment in country, we see ourselves again in concept promotion. We're working with some investment uh, impact investment companies. We're bringing, trying to promote a few pilot projects. We're looking in the future Maybe Biofund itself will be involved as an investor in some of these companies, certainly to mobilize blended finance grants with investments and guarantee quality standards. Those are all important roles for an institution like Biofund. Just an idea, in 2020, we, we in our innovative finance department, we had a, a budget of over $2 million to explore and look at getting these revenue streams on and, and growing. But I want to make sure it's really clear to everyone, most funds are still coming from traditional donors, World Bank, European Union, AFD. This is the base that gives you the credibility to innovate, build this up first, and then start these more speculative mechanisms or, or newer mechanisms, because you can only do them once you're already well established as an institution. So thanks very much. Uh, and I'm going to turn the floor over back to Kathy and Kat, Katie, sorry, and we'll and then we will uh, hear, I think, from the the Med Fund on some of their experiences now. So thanks very much, Sean. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences. Um, I want to remind everyone that if you have questions for the panelists after Roman's presentation, we will have a question and answer period. So please type your questions into the Q&A. There's a little, um, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that lets you access the Q&A function. And so add your questions there and we'll have the panelists address them uh, during the Q&A. So let me now introduce Roman Renault, who is the executive director of the Med Fund. And Roman is gonna highlight a different area that Amokar um, mentioned, which is the importance of the strategic planning process and, and having a fund, uh, resource mobilization plan uh, as part of the path forward. So, Roman, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. Uh, good afternoon to all of you from, from the Mediterranean region, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, I'm currently based in Monaco. And uh, this is just a few slides for you to set the scenes and to, to have a view of the Mediterranean region. Uh, just in few few numbers for you is that the Mediterranean Sea, although it's quite a small sea, uh, it hosts uh, almost 10% of the global marine biodiversity, which is quite uh, quite impressive, and it is surrounded by 21 uh, different countries. Um, as you all know, marine protected areas are really powerful tool uh, in the protection of the of the marine biodiversity. And up to now, 8% uh, of the Mediterranean Sea surface is covered by marine protected areas. But as uh, Sean already mentioned that, um, and as you know, uh, many MPAs are still uh, underfunded and uh, this has a strong effect of their effectiveness. So this is a reason why a few years ago now, uh, three countries, France, Monaco, and Tunisia have decided to launch a sustainable financing mechanism 
to support uh, core management costs of marine protected areas. And this is uh, when the Med Fund were, was born. So that was almost three years ago now. And uh, the objective for the fund for the next five years is to support at least 20 marine protected areas across the Mediterranean Sea and to protect up to 7,000 square kilometers of marine and coastal areas. And to do so, uh, we have a capitalization target for our endowment fund of uh, 30 million euro. Um, so in comparison to, to BioFund, which is an older trust fund, we are young uh, regional trust fund, which which is very specific, I think, uh, to, the, to the Med Fund. And we have a shared governance involving uh, Mediterranean countries. As I said, Monaco, France, Tunisia, but also Spain, Morocco, and Albania, and uh, regional organization and civil society. So I think this is also important to keep this information in mind because it has an impact on our fundraising strategy. Uh, we actually went through two different resource mobilization stages. Um, first, uh, we did raise funds for the establishment and the design of the CTF uh, and to fund pilot projects. So this is what we did in the past years. And until uh, I would say two years ago now, uh, we have started to raise funds for further consolidation and development of the trust fund itself. So this is actually when we designed a dedicated resource mobilization strategy. This process was funded by the GEF and uh, the FFM. And in conjunction of this mobilization strategy, we did draft our, uh, our uh, communication strategy. Um, I have added this, this slide because to me that was really important to, to say that our fundraising strategy uh, actually started at the design stage of the CTF, um, highlighting two aspects that are key in the fundraising strategy for us. One was the um, assessment of financial needs of Mediterranean MPAs and the assessment of a capitalization target for the firms. I think this is a key element that could seem obvious today, but that was not obvious at the time. So I think to, to start, uh, I would say an effective fundraising strategy, uh, you have to, to, to really have in mind what is your capitalization target for your funds. Uh, and the, the other point I want to share with you is that by uh, sharing uh, experiences, uh, via the CFA network, via Red Lack or CAFE. Uh, we had a lot of advice uh, coming from different trust funds, older trust funds than us. And they all advised us to design the MED fund uh, with different funding windows. Uh, so this is where the board has decided to create actually th three different windows, one for the endowment, one for sinking fund, and the third one for revolving fund, just to make sure that we were we will be able to cope with different donors' requirements, and that was really key. Uh, we've also uh, had a first, let's say, alliance of public and private donors. I think this is something that Sean and Amilcar, you 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 already point out, is the diversification of funding. So um, from now we have a global alliance of donors that support the MedFund activity. It goes from very institutional organizations such as the JEF, IFD, FFOM. And then we have uh, philanthropic, uh, philanthropist foundations such as the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation, uh, the used to be Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. And we also have an innovative, let's say, source of funding. Uh, we did create a dynamic network of aquariums and those across the Mediterranean Sea uh, that contributes to the Med Fund by dedicating part of the entrance fees of each aquarium to the Med Fund. Um, when we have decided to, to, to write this uh, um, fundraising strategy, uh, and this is 
an overview, I would say, of the main aspects of the fundraising strategy. This is the main contents of it. We had the, the, the I would say, the, the chance to be, to be supported in this process by, by Amil Kaur and the team of work company and uh, some very good consultants. And we went through this set of, of information. So as I said, the first thing for us was to set fundraising goals and targets to make sure we were uh, online with our strategy. Then we went through a selection of possible donors. We went through a database of hundreds of donors just to see which one were, was interested in marine protected areas in the Mediterranean region or in ocean conservation. And we were uh, able to target, I would say, priority donors. Based on that, uh, we did identify also uh, priorities and requirements for those different donors. And we clearly identified relevant types of interest, uh, including also uh, innovative funding, uh, as already Shen mentioned that. Uh, we did define also additional policies, such as the gift acceptance policy, that was really key. That was a key aspect of it, and I will come back to that later on. And this fundraising strategy provide us an, with an indicative timeline and some recommendation for implementation. And I will go uh, through it in a couple of slides just to highlight maybe key uh, findings of this, uh, of this work. First of all, and I think that we all agree on that, uh, we are young CTF, so we did focus on short-term priority first with institutional and philanthropic and private donors. But at the same time, we want to explore medium to long-term opportunity. So we, we have explored in our strategy uh, innovative funding mechanisms such as park bonds or, or even debt conversion. Another findings that we that we went through, and this is really key, is is um, building alliances. I think this is really key to build strategic partnership with key organization for us in the Mediterranean region to have a grand consortium and very robust alliance when you go and you talk to donors. And the second point, which is key, although, is to build on political momentum. I think that. This year, hopefully, will be the year of biodiversity. We'll have a lot of political momentum. The next one will be in Marseille, in France, in September, with the IUCN World uh, Congress for Nature. So those implement a fundraising strategy and to have roundtable of donors. Other finding that is also that was highlighting during this study is the, the, the importance of, of building your institutional capacity, trust, and reputation, because this is something also key when you reach a donor or when you reach a new donor. Uh, I think that in that respect, your governance is key. You need also to make the case that you deliver impact on the ground so that you are able to track conservation and also socioeconomic benefits. So this is very important to have indicator uh, in place when we have started our grant process. And then uh, you have to have a strong gift acceptance policy and a responsible investment policy that makes sense with your, with your mission. Another key finding also that uh, we went through that uh, during this, this process is to market your fund. Uh, I mean, when you talk to a new donor and especially when you talk to donors in the private sector or even in the philanthropy sector and you talk about MPA management costs, this is not really sexy. So uh, we had to really need to link these elements uh, and our core business, I would say, with thematic priorities of uh, other donors. And so we have developed dedicated concept notes um, uh, focusing on MPA and sustainable fisheries, MPA and climate change mitigation, MPA and blue economy, and MPA and connectivity, just to make your 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 fund, I think, more 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 
marketing in the in the in the market of the other donors. So that was really key, and we had the chance to develop at the same time our communication strategy. So that was really also useful for us to target key words and key aspects in our communication strategy. Then the second point that we 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 also work on was to uh, identify our added values beyond uh, ecological outcomes. And so we went through a couple of them. We are a regional conservation trust fund, and there is no other regional conservation trust fund in the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a clear added value. We have a science-based approach. We have a management effectiveness dashboard that we are using for each of our grantee, and this is key for us. We do promote the co-management of MPA, and I saw also in your presentation, Sean, that this is something also that you want to, to, to put forward. We have a strong gender approach, so this is something that we are really, um, uh, let's say, um, working on that with our grantees. And one specificity of our action is that we directly fund civil society organizations as MPA managers. So that was really important for us to market those different elements as part of our um, fundraising strategy. Then uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I think one key finding also is to stay tuned and thanks to the CFA, thanks to the Red Lag, thanks to the CAFE and thanks to all this networking. I think that's very, very important to share a knowledge and to share also uh, opportunities. And so I think the donors watch is really key uh, in order to catch the flavor of the month. I mean, now we are in a post COVID era. So when it, at all projects now uh, needs to, needs to uh, uh, target blue economy, needs to target uh, development of local community and all this build back better mantra is uh, is really key so donors watch and uh, stay tuned is key and then the the, the the last point i want to stress and i was really impressed by the by your slides and with all the people working for biofund we are a very small team here in the med fund only three people and i think that we cannot ex 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 expect sorry uh, no return on investment without investment in in, in human resources. So I think this is really key also for the trust fund and uh, for some board members that could that could be uh, with us this afternoon that we need to allocate financial and human resources to do this job. And especially for the grant writing part, which is uh, quite time consuming. And then I think it's also very important to, 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 to involve and to promote board members and partners involvement to facilitate high level key contacts with some donors, uh, especially institutional donors. So I think that this fundraising strategy is not only, uh, I would say work for the team, but it's also a work for all the trust fund, including the board members. And I guess that was my last slide. Yes, thank you very much. Roman, thank you so much. That was great. Um, we have a few questions, so we'll have about 10 minutes for question and answer. I should have flagged earlier, actually. It looks like the, the invitation or the RSVP may have suggested that this is a two-hour webinar. It's actually a one-hour webinar, so, um, so we do just have 10 minutes left in the hour and uh, several questions that have come in. Let me first mention before we move to the Q&A that we have um, an online discussion forum within LinkedIn. I put the link for that in the chat. Um, I hope you will join us. We have a poll question there to ask you about your resource mobilization challenges. We'd love to hear um, what the issues are that you're experiencing and then what solutions you've found. Uh, so please do join us. Um, again, the link, it's a LinkedIn group. The link is in the chat. You'll need to ask to join and, and Kumar will admit you quickly. Uh, so let me then go to the Q&A. One of the first questions that came up was about whether we'll share the PowerPoint presentations, and that is up to the panelists, but if they're willing to do that, we'll put the PDFs uh, on the CFA website, and you'll be able to find them on the, um, mm -hmm. the webinars page, which I'm about to add to the chat shortly. So uh, the first question is for Sean, 
um, from Rodolfo. Sean, the question is in the future, looking at impact investment funds, how will Biofund be providing research, uh, revenue sources to be able to pay for the funding? So essentially what's the revenue mechanism for engaging in impact investing? Okay, we're actually sort of exploring that right now. We're sort of seeing what are the different models and how can you be involved in impact investment? So it, let's say we're, we're in impact investment helping be a, a, what we'll probably start, what we're starting with actually is giving grants to for-profit companies. We're not asking for a return on that. These are grants, these are third-party funding, it's other people's money. We're doing it to promote that particular business model. And we're not expecting a specific return on that. Although obviously if they're profitable investments, they may come back and, and be donors to Biofund in the future. Um, other funds that we're looking for to actually become equity investors and part owners of some of these businesses. If that happens, then we will obviously take a, a share of any, any operating profits. We have had a couple of, of people come looking for us and asking us to become equity investors. Our board is still grappling with whether or not we want to do that. Um, there are other ways to do it, which is also giving, giving sort of softer loans, in which case obviously we get a, we get a percent return on those loans as part of our return as a company or as, as, a, as an entity, sorry. That's a short answer. <laughs> Uh, Great, son. Thanks. While you, while we've got you on the screen, let me also ask um, from Angelique Pompidou, um The question came up about what was the selling point for the banks to get involved um, in the credit card program? I'm assuming that's okay. a reference to the credit card program. Thanks, Angelique. Yeah, I mean, we went and talked to them. Uh, it does help that the chair of our board is the is the former chair of that bank. Um, so we got our, our foot in the door very high level. And uh, they're already involved in a number of, of uh, corporate social responsibility activities and, uh, and uh, we're very interested in doing that. So we developed the concept together with them. And I think it's important when you're looking at these kind of programs, they get developed together with the, the, the private entity. And then you can sort of, both sides can, can move into it slowly, but both sides also get to, to define the program in the first place. So I think those were, those were key things that they were interested in doing and they get visibility out of it. We, made, we, we do certainly tell them that uh, uh, all the projects we're gonna fund through this particular mechanism are sort of slightly more high visibility, more sexy programs than our normal uh, operating cost drama. Um, so we've you know, helped tag rhinos and dehorn them. We're protecting the, most, the rarest tree in Mozambique in, in one other place. We're gonna, we're gonna do some tagging of, 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 uh, of the rarest stingray on the planet, which happens to live in Mozambique and things like that. These are kind of cool things that the banks are, are interested in. It's publicity for them as well. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Romana, quick um, technical question for you about the aquariums. Are they part of the private sector or do you, um, what, what's the MedFund's relationship to the aquariums that you partner with? Yes, actually they are private sectors. Uh, what we did is that we had an agreement with one of them, which is the uh, Oceanographic Museum in Monaco, and they do uh, have, um, they are part of uh, uh, international networks of many uh, aquariums across the globe. So we are using them to promote this approach and try to have more uh, aquariums uh, on board with us in the coming years. Great. Thanks. Another question that came up in the chat for you, Ramat, is um, you mentioned the, the management effectiveness dashboard. Is there a link that you could share um, to that that other people could see? Uh, yeah, I'll see what I can share. This is something that we are actually working on to make it more um, easy to, to, uh, to, to, let's say, to communicate. So I will share that information with you, yes, of course. Great, thank you. If you could send it to Kumar, then we can put it up on the um, the webinars page um, as additional resources or, or the things okay. that were shared. Yep. Um, and I will just flag for people, the link to the webinars page is also in the chat. So um, that's where we will post um, links of resources that were discussed, the recording of this webinar and the, the PowerPoint slides for those uh, who can share them. Um, so let me go to a question to both Sean Arama from Ahmed in, in Martania about um, whether you have conducted assessments of the value of the ecosystem services of the protected areas as part of your fundraising strategy. Um, hi, Ahmed. Um, 
we we didn't we haven't done them as part of sort of the overall fundraising strategy. As I mentioned, we're exploring some payment for ecosystem services uh, in in one protected area right now as a pilot project to see if we can actually get a scheme to to generate revenue. As you probably know, most ecosystem services are diffuse. They give a great deal of benefit, but they're hard to sort of turn into into hard, cold hard cash and. Uh, um, we're a financing mechanism. So it's not just a question of doing an academic exercise and showing the government how much ecosystem services we have in the country that can be useful in some contexts. It's not really useful in ours because it's not gonna be possible to, to make the government give us, give conservation more money using that argument. So we're looking for very concrete little schemes. So we're doing a little bit of that, but certainly not at, at, a, at a protected area network level. I don't know about Roma. Have you guys done that? Yeah, no, I think it's the same situation. Bonjour, uh, Hamid. Uh, no, I think it's the same situation for, for, for us, actually. We do not have that at the marine protected areas level by itself. But of course, this is something that we highlight and we promote at the regional level, making, I mean, the link between marine protected areas and uh, climate uh, carbon sequestration, for example, with the Posidonia Meadows, or also linking marine protected areas with the recovery of fish, uh, commercial fish stocks, for example. So those are elements that uh, we definitely highlight in our approach to new donors, but uh, not at the, the, the protected area uh, level. Great, thanks. Um, let me uh, move to, um, a uh, question from Karen Price at, at Meet. Um, Karen points out resource mobilization goes hand in hand with effective communication and the ability of conservation trust funds to brand and market the fund. Could Sean and Roman, could you talk about um, the experiences that you've had in the level of investment needed for communication to support resource mobilization? Go first, Sean. <laughs> I should think about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you've probably dedicated more to it than we have. Our, to be truly honest, our best fundraising strategy has been to be competent, effective, and efficient. And the vast amount of our money, Mozambique is a small conservation community, a vast amount of our money comes from the big donors who are here and see that we are an excellent and useful channel for them. And we started small, and by showing that we can actually deliver uh, deliver money onto the ground effectively, efficiently, we can monitor, we can look at impacts, uh, that's brought us a, a lot of extra funds. So we haven't done a huge amount of these road shows, doing communication for fundraising and so on. We've thought about it. We actually haven't done a great deal of it yet. Obviously producing a few good communications materials is key. So a, a, a very pretty annual report is good that shows both what you're doing, showcases a little bit what you're doing. Um, and obviously, you know, when you can do small films, do little things, do brochures about your different programs and so on, get that out and, and moving. And uh, uh, as you grow, I think you're doing more communications. And, and again, communications only works if, it, if at the base, you are a good and effective delivery mechanism. Roma? Yeah. Um, bonjour, Karen, Madame la Présidente. Um, yes, uh, actually, uh, I think that was, in our case, what is interesting to, to say is that this uh, fundraising strategy uh, has been funded by uh, institutional donors. So I think that this is something that donors are really keen on supporting because most of the time they know that we need diversification of fund and uh, they could be of a great support. Uh, so I think there is two different kinds of costs. I mean, there is a cost of the study itself and this, the cost is, uh, is, is, uh, is something uh, I can share with you. And also then you have the implementation of your strategy because it's, uh, you can have a fantastic uh, strategy, but if you do not implement it, then it's no use. So then you have to dedicate part of your time and we have, uh, we could not hire a dedicated staff to do so. So we have a network of consultants 
uh, that could work for us on, a, I would say, a project basis that we can, we can really contact. And regarding the communication strategy, we did the same. I think that um, the Jeff and the FFM really were keen on funding this communication strategy. So we use this project to produce videos, to produce brochures, to produce a lot of materials once, uh, once in a while. And then we will use that in the following years. Great. Thanks to you both. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time and we still have great questions that are coming in through the Q&A. So what I would really encourage everyone to do is to go to the LinkedIn group, um, the online discussion forum. The link is in the chat. Um, there's a poll there, but also the opportunity to continue this conversation with additional great questions. We have still seven more webinars coming up in this series in 2021. Um, the June webinar coming up on the 15th will focus on asset management, uh, so the investment management side of, of CTFs. We have technology in July, governance and institutional effectiveness in August, risk management and safeguards in September, and then we will move into a series of three um, specific um, CT, uh, webinars on using the standards and how those apply in both um, assessment and self-assessment in the starting up phase of a CTF and um, in for those CTFs that have pursued accreditation, how the standards have been helpful in those. So again, thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our three panelists. Um, great presentations from all of you. Um, please do visit the LinkedIn group and uh, please check back on the webin webinars page on the CFA website where we'll be posting um, resources and links from today's webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you in June.